Welcome to Merging Mindsets panel discussion on um, managing digital collections. And uh, we've got uh, this panel tonight is part of a series of panels that we've been doing and coming together with a conference in March and an Instructables Day that we're going to be doing in uh, April. It's, it's going to be quite amazing. Uh, this is going to be recorded and will be available for viewing on our website uh, later in February. And before I uh, start, I want to just speak very quickly about merging mindsets and then make a couple of comments. Um, merging Mindsets is a project that uh, will expand opportunities for artists to create using digital technologies while broadening connections with interactive digital media, related companies that want to innovate using creative talent. Please join us as we embark on an exciting series of community building e events exploring the digital technology in art and the art in digital technology and connecting the people in between. In cities around the world, creative arts and interactive digital media sectors are bringing their respective skills together to imagine and create exciting new events, art, and projects. Merging digital technologies with artistic practice. Um, in Manitoba, we're really ready to showcase what our vibrant arts community and interactive digital media sector can do together. The Merging Mindsets project is a joint effort from Creative Manitoba, New Media Manitoba, and the Video Pool Media Arts Centre. And we'd like to thank and acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund for the project. I'm going to introduce the panelists in just a second, but first I want to make a couple of statements. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 1 territory, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene, and homeland of the Métis Nation. I would also like to note that it's our intent to uh, foster a supportive and non-threatening environment for everyone to participate and share in, regardless of gender, ability, ethnicity, or cultural differences. We ask that you please be welcoming and respectful of worldviews that differ from your own. All right, all that out of the way. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, Jerry Lawson is uh, a member in Heltsuk. Health Health That's good. That's good. Uh, First Nation manages the oral history and, and language lab at UVC Museum of Anthropology. Um, I'm really interested in the work that you're doing in preserving indigenous languages, and, and that sounds really interesting, and uh, how you're using digital technology for language revival and, and, and pre uh, preservation. So I'm not going to say much more. If you want, you can read the bio, or there's lots online. Sure, grab, the grab the mic, and, and please, Jerry, give us uh, cool. a bit. Um, luckily, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So. Uh, Thank you all for coming. It's a little bit snowy out there. And, um, yeah, and just very quickly, it's interesting to be here, and I'm really privileged and fortunate to be here, but I don't manage an art collection, and I um, often speak at these events around archiving and access, and the fact that I don't manage a collection puts me in that position that I don't have to sort of manage the technical aspects of making decisions around access. but. Uh, a really big part of what I do is intentionality around not making the decisions for other people around access and preservation. So I just wanted to start out with um, the fact that I don't manage access for anything, but I help people to digitize their collections that, um, so that they can be accessible. Um, and the other part of that is much of the collections that I work with are cultural heritage and um, uh, language material, and when you think of a traditional or in an art collection, you generally have one thing in mind, but if um, there are a lot of extremely knowledgeable people I know on the coast in BC who say that they, we have no, no word for art, that that's not, um, well, it's a concept. It's not something we have an explicit word for, and I know um, high to language speakers say this, I'm not sure about my own language, Helchikla. Um, but that doesn't mean, of course, that there's not art. Um, so our entire potlatch system is based on um, performance and illusion and storytelling. And so art sort of permeates our entire knowledge system as opposed to necessarily needing its own word for being something separate. Um, so just to sort of position, I guess, why I'm here, <laughs> why I feel like I belong here. Um, so <laughs> quickly, uh, I work at the UBC Museum of Anthropology. I've been there for about a decade now. And um, we are best known for um, the 
uh, architecture. It was designed by a prominent Canadian architect, Arthur Erickson. Um, and so it's a, sort of a mecca for a lot of people who study architecture uh, to look at the building. And it was built, purpose built around the totem poles. The Great Hall uh, was, uh, was built explicitly for the totem pole collection that was at UBC before the museum existed. Um, the work of Haida artist Bill Reed, the massive sculptures, and then, um, and then we really are well known for our potlatch collections, our uh, material culture collections of, um, around uh, the coastal um, potlatch celebrations. Um, to give a little bit of context to what I do, there are over 70 Indigenous languages in Canada. Um, almost half of them exist in British Columbia and most of them exclusively in British Columbia. There are the ones that overlap borders, colonial borders on the outskirts, but it is an extremely, one of the world's most dense linguistic um, places on earth. That was redundant. Um, one of the things that makes this very personal to me is that's my father, um, Chester Lawson. His, um, uh, the name that he carries uh, is Komagoya, which is um, one of our hereditary chief's names in Belbala. Um, and this is what makes it really personal to me is that this is the part of the media collection um, in my own home community. And um, when you consider 203 unique community, indigenous communities in British Columbia, every single one of them has these recordings. Um, broad, broad formats, um, early adopters of technology, um, voraciously recording our own heritage with whatever we can get, um, plus anthropologists and linguists and ethnomusicologists and um, everybody who comes into our communities and records. We have repatriated analog collections from those people as well. Um, so around the time that I met Emma and Julie and or just before, I was doing a lot of work with my sister who was the uh, archivist and the head of the uh, Union of BC Indian Chiefs Re Resource Centre, which is the most active legal resource centre for Indigenous um, rights and title in Canada. Um, and the Resource Centre supports about 20 um, legal researchers um, on the floor above them um, pretty much at all times. Um, so it's extremely active and they have a very broad, um, varied media collection. And uh, when I was kind of in between things, I started working with my sister to um, start with technical support, but then we started to work on digitization um, back in the early 2000s um, of this uh, media collection. And what we found was that uh, there was incredible frustration and this lasted for um, I, I would say it's not entirely gone, that uh, frustrations around digitization and digitization practices uh, were extremely difficult. And this was an organization that had, I think, about four permanent staff members in the resource, resource center, plus myself on contract, uh, very smart people. It had people with, you know, masters of archival studies, like um, MASs and... Um, and still, it was very, very difficult to approach best practices and to figure out, to get through the jargon of um, audio engineering and um, broadcast engineering and archival practices. Um, and no matter how we tried, we could never meet or figure out if we were meeting best practices. Um, and a lot of times, best practices sort of affect whether or not you can get a grant. Um, and most of... At the time, there were no grants. There were very few grants available for digitization, and they all required open access for a number of years, that things had to be made publicly available, um, and often required you to be an accredited archive, be open to the public, certain open hours, certain environmental conditions, and there was no Indigenous organization I knew of that met these criteria. And for anybody who knows Indigenous knowledge, there was no... Um, uh, most of our recordings are recorded around knowledge that has specific cultural protocol associated with it. So not just you can't make it openly accessible. There has to be some gatekeeper to sort of figure out whether or not um, you have the privilege to, to listen to that thing or to view that thing. Um, or else it was actually recorded for legal research and has Western information um, restrictions on it. Uh, but certainly th there's no collection I knew of that could just be blanket made openly accessible. Um, 
And uh, so the program at UBC, the indigenization program that I'll be talking about in a little while, uh, one of the things that we do very well is uh, bridge um, students and the academic side of information with uh, community work. And one of the things that we're really proud of is our Twitter feed that is largely um, generated by students that we work with. And we did a takeover last summer of uh, something of an open, open glam account, um, galleries like libraries, archives, museums. Um, and open glam is a fairly new movement and it is very pro open information. Um, and so a lot of the concepts that were brought up around um, open information being a very sort of Western mainstream concept that it affects different communities in different ways uh, was sort of a foreign concept to a lot of people that followed this. So it's a, if you do want to hear a little bit more about sort of indigenous information and openness, uh, um, I would urge you to just do a Google search of um, indigenization and open glam. And uh, some of the conversations and a lot of the threads, uh, we took it over for two weeks and it was an ungodly amount of work. So. Um, so in, in the early days of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, we, um, really everything was on a budget because if you, any of you worked with grants uh, of any kind, you'll apply for a grant, you'll hear you get a grant, but you don't get money for months after that. But then your project is slated to have started <laughs> well before the, the money gets going, um, largely because of inefficiencies in grant processes. And, um, and so what we found is that I would be buying things off eBay, I would be spending my money bringing my equipment in, bringing my hard drives in, and working for free until, we, until the money started to flow. And then uh, that was, uh, at the time, actually a pretty good savings technique for me. But, um, and we developed some really interesting ghetto processes of this is a cleaning machine for open reel, uh, half inch open reel video, which um, a lot of artist run centers have a tremendous amount of, and all of it has um, soft binder syndrome. All of it has friction issues and needs to be mechanically cleaned. It, it often needs to be baked, but also needs to be mechanically cleaned. And um, this is one of the things that I did a little talk at um, the Association of Moving Image Archivists a couple of months ago, and this, this went over huge. People just loved the fact that I put together something that other organizations were paying about $25,000 for, which also seems like a stupid amount of money. Um, so quickly, this is where I work now and have for about 10 years, and I always have to let people know that this was probably about day two of being in the office. It hasn't been this clean in 10 years. Um, <laughs> But you can see some of the equipment. We have open reel, we have multiple video formats, um, cassette, and then uh, quite a, just an ever-growing number of analog playback equipment to support different formats. Um, and shortly after I um, got to UBC, um, I was invited into a pilot project by somebody else who came to UBC that had also worked with me at the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, Mimi Lam. Um, and she was managing a pilot project called Indigization, and it was about creating a toolkit for Indigenous communities. So for all the reasons that I talked about, communities were not starting to digitize their collections. Um, they wouldn't give up provenance because they were too precious, and um, they wouldn't allow anybody else to take custody of those things to digitize, and there were a lot of questions around outsourcing. But trying to do it yourself was, was too prohibitive. There's so many barriers up that people would start to do, look into and research how to digitize, but then would run into too many roadblocks and then just go back to all of the great things that they already do. And it's worth knowing that everybody who works in a community managing information does about 10 times the breadth of work that somebody at a university has to do. They do so much heavy lifting for their community um, that, uh, if they run into a tremendous roadblocks around one thing, they've already got work piling up off the side. They go back to the things that they're really good at, and what ends up happening is that that work just doesn't get done. And I think we all know how important it is to um, get the, your analog material uh, digitized for preservation. Um, so around that request, uh, it was really a request to help uh, put together some equipment to loan to communities. but. All of my background and the people I work with uh, told us that you can't just do that. You can't just send them a number of boxes and here you go. 
digitize. Um, people who don't do it for a living won't feel confident they put the equipment together right, they won't know what software to use, they won't know what file format to go to, and they won't know the workflows for preservation. So what we did was um, we worked with my own community, the Helter Cultural Education Center. Uh, at MOA, we wrote a 90-page manual to digitize the easiest format there is to digitize. <laughs> um, but we put in planning advice and um, uh, media assessment uh, processes and digitization processes and a little bit around access and a little bit around preservation um, so that managers would have at least a fighting chance to be able to uh, plan out a project to digitize something and not have it be more at risk than in the analog. And that's Jennifer Carpenter and Rory Housty. Jennifer has been the uh, director of the Cultural Education Center since 1980, I believe. And uh, Rory has uh, since gone on to become the language teacher at the college in Bella Bella. Um, and that is the first kit that we put together. And we knew that we had something decent when they didn't send it back. They just said, send us a bill. So um, that's kind of when you know that uh, when somebody's used something for, you know, probably almost a year and could buy something new if they wanted to but decides to keep the thing that they've got then it's probably not bad um, and then like any other pilot project you worry about what happens when the pilot project is over you put all this work into the thing and then by you know definition there is no money left so we went back to the uh, Irving K Barber Center who funded the original project hoping that uh, we could get um, some extension on it and they ended up uh, investing $100,000 a year into turning it into a grant program. And um, I'm not sure how much time I have left. I'm guessing about eight minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to start moving it faster. So for the last five years, we've been a grant program. And along all of those frustrations I talked about around the money not flowing, um, we found in the early years, uh, I'll quickly sort of go through, we do a lot of hand-holding, helping people to plan their projects, ha helping people to fill out, which helps you fill out your um, application. Um, we included in-person training into the grant, which most grants obviously don't do, but because there wasn't a lot of information out there, we found that having people come and get hands-on training and train together could create cohorts of its own support system. And we've been trying to create a community of practice around digitization and indigenous community practitioners, and we're finding that's, that's bearing out. That, uh, that again, you won't necessarily know if you've built a community, because they'll, they'll stop talking to you, they'll start talking to each other. But sort of through the grapevine, we're finding that, uh, that people are doing that. And we teach a little bit of project management, um, special processing and repair of cassettes. Um, we also, uh, I don't like to bring people into a place and just have them sit in one room and not get a greater understanding of um, where they are. Uh, and so uh, I've lost the slide for it somewhere, but uh, we do have um, Musqueam, who's a traditional territory that we sit on and we have a very close relationship with the museum, comes in to do a welcome every cohort we have. Um, and the uh, picture in the top left is um, Judy Thompson, who's the uh, language, uh, um, the director of the language program for the Taltan Nation. Um, she is flipping through a report at, at Huewa, which is the uh, First Nations um, library at UBC, um, where my sister was working at the time. And she's actually, uh, we had told the library who was coming, they brought out the things they thought might be int of interest, and that report was lost to the community. That's a language report that even the author of the report didn't have a copy of. So by the end of the day, they walked away with a digital and a physical copy of that report. Um, and the, at the, the other, next one is the lunch uh, at the Longhouse uh, Stuyweton uh, Great Hall. And so we try to introduce the people to everybody who works really well and ethically with communities and we found that we haven't found an instance where there wasn't some sort of synergy or some extra um, benefit from introducing people to different parts of UBC who do good work. Um, and then of course we do the same thing at UBC, that the, the museum and the laboratory of archaeology that's co-sited with us do a tremendous amount of work with communities and um, we try to introduce people to the different parts of our own organizations. Um, so. We've been running for about five years. Uh, we've um, helped to fund 45 projects in 34 communities and almost, um, sorry about that, uh, 
almost 12,000 cassettes um, digitized through our um, through our grant program. Um, and of course, there are many, many more cassettes that have been digitized. And what we found is that uh, almost every project that we help with, uh, the project is set aside either for the person doing the digitization to go off and help with a legal team that's responding to say a pipeline incursion or something that's trying to support an injun injunction or bring traditional knowledge into some um, Western incursion that the community has to fight against or else the people who are doing the digitization go off to digitize private collections in support of cultural practices that are going to be happening um, that fall or, or on that time frame. So if there are potlatches coming up, families will often find out somebody's digitizing tapes, bring tapes in, and then they'll be digitizing tapes for families. Um, and that is really one of the things that we are hoping to accomplish as well, is that they, we know that there is this invisible collection of family recordings in community that, if you think small organizations have trouble with digital preservation, families have, um, you know, a much greater magnified problem. And uh, so helping to build those trust relationships between community organizations and community members is one of the big things that we're trying to accomplish and we're seeing happen in, uh, in the program. So this is the most recent cohort. And what we found is that BC had an investment of $50 million into Indigenous languages over... Um, this year and the next uh, year and a little bit. And what that did was actually allow for people who do language work to do language work, like to not be taking on other jobs. Um, it is um, an activity that has not been invested in and not, has not actually paid a living wage for people in our communities. And we're finding with the investment, it is now. And so everybody who would be digitizing collections as part of language are busy teaching language. So we actually had a record low number of applicants in our program. So what we did was um, invite other community organizations that may not be ready to start or else um, we have a number of people from um, different archival communities or else from the First Peoples Cultural Council who uh, do who distribute most of the language funding in British Columbia and have just opened a um, they were about to announce a digitization grant program somewhat based on our own uh, that is actually much, much larger than ours. So, um, so instead of sort of accepting the fact that we had a low number of applicants, we turned around and tried to see how can we still be effective? Well, half of the people who would be engaging with us in a normal basis are too busy to engage. How can we remain an effective um, assisting force in this. Um, so these are a couple of funding initiatives. There's Library and Archives Canada has the Listen, Hear Our Voices program, and uh, First Peoples has the Digitization Grant Initiative, Digi. Um, and I just spoke with Kevin Perkins, who is running this grant um, before I came here, <laughs> like literally an hour and a half ago. Um, and they'll be having their first grant workshop in, at Musqueam in, Van, um, in Vancouver, uh, with our assistance and the assistance of the Musqueam archives. Uh, so all of these sort of synergies are building up to us being able to not grow what we do by expanding ourselves, but sort of putting those capacities into other organizations. And so we're actually going to be setting our grant aside for this year to support these two much larger grant initiatives, um, helping communities to get access to these two pools of funding that uh, really are only guaranteed for the next couple of years and especially the Listen, Hear Our Voices grant, um, I'm not sure if that one will be extended beyond um, two years. So, um, so quickly for next steps, uh, in 2016 we had something called the Futures Forum, where we invited about 20 of our previous participants in the grant. Um, other, we went and got funding to bring them to Vancouver for the uh, um, gathering. And then all of the people who were professionals in the field of information sciences um, in communities, not academics, not people who sort of do that work at larger institutions, but people who um, do that work and do that work with communities and have an understanding of communities, um, and had a two-day workshop that basically was trying to figure out where our gaps were. We knew what problem we were trying to address, it was a mountain of audio cassettes that weren't being digitized. And that was the, that was the big problem. 
but sort of where do we go from there once we start to get momentum? Um, and that is other formats, open real video, uh, updating toolkits, uh, online and self-serve. Um, and I think what's not here is how do you manage and give access? And that's uh, one of the big things is, uh, I'm, some of you might have heard of Mukatu, which is a uh, digital asset management system designed for indigenous knowledge and indigenous communities. And it works very well for what it is, but every platform has its problems. And what I've found is that a lot of communities in British Columbia are not ready to be trying to give their own community members self-serve access to knowledge. They're still trying to support Indigenous lands, rights, titles, um, responding to something called business referrals, where if a business wants to do work and dig in your area, they put in a referral and you have 30 days to respond to that or you've given approval to that thing or you have no ability to respond. So I've got a friend who's got 70 open files on her desk at pretty much all times. If, so that's the kind of um, mountain of information requests that people in communities are responding to just to not have their traditional territories and sacred sites damaged further. Um, so, uh, but what I am finding is that some communities, especially once they're doing governance work, my own community is developing a constitution where we're bringing the traditional heat must, the traditional chiefs and traditional knowledge holders back into a formalized part of governance. And what uh, we found in our neighboring communities have found is that a lot of the people who carry the names don't have the knowledge anymore. Don't, we haven't had that responsibility of governance along with that title for so long that a lot of the history of that is not, um, doesn't come along with the name. So people, so we are trying to um, basically retrain our own um, hereditary leaders in what their traditional responsibilities are. And I mean, some of it has carried through for sure, and a lot of the practices have carried through, but with Indian agents and um, Western governance, a lot of that has sort of been taken away, and we're trying to figure out how to bring that back in and have a blended system. And for that, you need some sort of an access system for knowledge that uh, is, and protocols, so that uh, people will know what they have rights to and what, what they don't. Um, So we have some um, new partners. Uh, the, the Musqueam Archives has been one of the community centers that is doing the most amazing work and has far surpassed what we've supported. And they are actually a full partner in the um, workshop that's happening actually two weeks from now for the First Peoples Cultural Council. And so Musqueam has been digitizing video and open real audio and um, all sorts of formats for their community members and is tracking the metadata around what they're digitizing, but they're not demanding a copy of any of the things that they digitize for their own community. Um, First Peoples Cultural Council, uh, Mount Royal University in uh, Calgary paid for our program to go out in September and do training with the Blackfoot Confederacy. So that was our first training session outside of the province. So we're looking at doing uh, more of those. But beyond looking at doing more of those, we're actually looking at trying to build out our resources to the point where other people can do it themselves, where these training sessions can happen without having to clone me or fly me everywhere. Um, and um, with that in mind, we actually are just in the process of last stages of negotiating a National Research Council Indigenous Language Technologies um, grant, essentially, to build out our resources to support multiple video formats and open real audio formats so that we'll have similar manuals, similar buying guides and things so that people um, can access these much larger grants widely across the country without having to involve us. Because right now we are sort of the bottleneck for what we do, um, our sort of time and ability. And, um, and yeah, that's about it. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That was uh, very enlightening. I have a the whole bunch of questions that I want to ask. Um, that it's a, it's a fascinating idea that you're having to 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 um, digitize the knowledge so that it's there to to reeducate your communities. It's it's um, very interesting. Uh, our next speakers are um, Colleen Leduc and uh, Nicole Fletcher from the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Um, 
and they're just sorting out their technology. <laughs> Colleen is the, the learning and programs coordinator at the, at the WAG, and she develops educational programming, including special projects for the art galleries Inuit Art Center. She's a background as a practicing visual artist and art educator and art therapist, um, and she's very passionate about technology as a tool to uh, enhance accessibility. Um, Nicole is a collections coordinator at WAG and has experience in collections, archives, digital resource libraries and art galleries and is working to develop resources in the gallery to support collection-based research and provide wider access to information. And without further ado, I'll uh, thank you, let the two of you. Thanks. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, so, I'm Colleen LeDuc, I'm a Learning and Programs Coordinator at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and um, in that uh, title I offer a variety of things to the WAG. Um, I oversee school programs um, and teacher PDs and workshops. Um, one of the parts of my job that I really love is um, I get the opportunity to work with an Inuit elder named Fred Ford, um, who's the director of the Manitoba, or director of the board for the Manitoba Inuit Association here. And um, we offer a program called Virtual Tours, where um, we teach um, art to schools in Nunavut um, using video conferencing equipment. Um, Fred has an amazing collection of hundreds if not thousands of tools and art items and artifacts um, and he brings um, coolers full of them in and shares them to students um, over this equipment. Um, and then I'm also working on some special projects uh, connected to the Inuit Art Center um, that I'll be talking a bit more about. Can you do this? I'm Nicole and I'm the collections coordinator at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, so I manage all of the artwork in the gallery. Um, my job changed a little bit back in March, so <laughs> I think all of our jobs changed a little bit back in March, but I handle acquisitions and all the paperwork to do with that, copyright, um, all of our artwork photography, um, a lot of it's analog on slides and all of our exhibition photography because we take pictures of every exhibition that's happened since 1971 pretty much. Oh, that's me. So what is the Winnipeg Art Gallery? It's the oldest civic art gallery in Canada and it was founded in 1912. The current location, which you see here, um, was opened in 1971 which was providing um, a purpose-built home for the art gallery. Um, so Princess Margaret came and officially opened the art gallery in 1974. Um, sorry, mm -hmm. um, after opening the WAG on the memorial location, which is where we currently are, the collection began growing immediately. We got tons and tons of donations and purchases. Um, Inuit art became a cornerstone of the collection. We bought a huge collection from James Toomey of 1,400 uh, Inuit sculptures, and the collection just kept growing from there. Uh, since then, Inuit art has remained a major component of our collection, but we also have strong holdings in other areas, which you can see from our graph. Um, and there's some examples of some prominent pieces in our collection, um, some other major components of our collection are Canadian and um, decorative arts. Next slide. Uh, so the total collection is 27,907 pieces. Uh, almost half of that is Inuit with 12,018 and deck arts is 4,681. And on top of that, we have another 9,770 pieces on long-term loan. So it's quite a bit of art that we have in the gallery. Oh, um, and this is our current Inuit vault. So we have four vaults um, in the current building. This is our Inuit art vault where we hold most of the sculptures. So you can see things are pretty cramped. Usually this table is not full. That was just a recent donation we had gotten. Um, but this is why we need a new building. Each of the shelves there are stacked 
three or four sculptures deep. Um, so yeah, this table is often used to move a sculpture out so you can access a sculpture in behind. So yes, this is why we needed the new building and um, we are currently building the Inui Art Center. Um, So the NUE Art Center is going to provide an amazing opportunity for our collection to grow. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to show more of our collection that we currently have. Often much of it is, is in the vault in the basement. Um, and what I'm really excited about is the opportunity to show more contemporary shows, especially contemporary NUE shows. Um, we are also going to be building two new artwork vaults in the Inuit Art Center, or the IAC. Um, one, one is gonna be underground and will hold light sensitive Inuit works such as prints, drawings, textiles, and sculptures with organic materials. A lot of the sculptures we have have components of whalebone, um, caribou, antlers, fur, so it'll be nice to have a vault that is better suited for that. Um, the highlight of the building, um, so on, we're also changing the front of the WAG a bit. As you may have noticed, if you've been by the WAG, um, we're adding these windows that you can see um, on the side that's going to open up the WAG. Up until now, it's been kind of a very cold wall. We're going to be able to allow some light into the actual WAG, and that theme's going to carry around to the main floor of the Inui Art Center. And through the windows, we're gonna be able to see kind of the centerpiece, the focal piece of the IAC, and it's gonna be a visible vault. Um, I think it's gonna be quite stunning when we walk in the lo lobby, and suddenly you can see thousands of pieces on display, um, potentially about five to 6,000 pieces. Um, so the um, education, and collections department have been partnering, to, partnering together on a project to help animate this visible vault. Um, we think of this as a great opportunity um, where, our, where the public can engage with the art in a different way. So we're working on a platform where we're gonna be um, including touch screens in front of the vault um, where you can see the images of the sculpture and um, learn more about the sculpture, the history of the sculpture, the artist, the materials. Here's another view of the vault. It's kind of this organic shape. Um, and on the side here are learning stairs, or the learning steps where we'll be able to have talks and have presentations. Um, have school groups come in to talk to. Um, so hurdles, am I on the hurdles page? Oh, <laughs> this is a view from inside the vault and um, the people who did this rendering put a backpack on someone inside. So <laughs> please, if you visit, no backpacks inside the vault. <laughs> <laughs> it should really just be Nicole on the inside of, of <laughs> this, and I don't know if you wanted to mention that about um, the backside, or am I mentioning? Yeah, yeah so, so on the inside will be where um, WAG staff can access the sculptures from the inside, so we will, when we look at them from the inside, we're going to be seeing the backside of these pieces. Um, is that my next slide here? Yeah, so that's something really beautiful about some of our sculptures are they are really amazing to see th from 3D. So that's a hurdle that we've tackled is, or tr are trying to tackle is how are we going to um, have the public be able to see the full sculpture? And I think having a digital platform, a touch screen where there's images, um, we can see multiple views of the sculptures. We'll be able to zoom in and see details that maybe we weren't able to see before. Um, let's see here. So these are some shots of the touch screen that uh, we're wor working on building right now. Um, a really important part of this project um, is having the voice of the artist come through the art. Um, I really wanna connect the artist with the artwork. Um, so art is a voice. 
Um, we're gonna have a map on uh, the, the touch screen so that it's really connecting the artwork to the communities that the artwork comes from and give people a better sense of the different uh, communities in Nunavut. Um, and like I mentioned, really connecting the artist with the different pieces and being able to offer biographies um, and having uh, audio, audio recordings. We're very fortunate that you're meeting with us tomorrow at the WAG to help us with our project. Um, we're hoping to have some 360 views of some of the pieces created as well. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. So here will be an example of how we're hoping it may work, where you see the artists, you can learn about um, the artwork. Uh, we'll have some video components as well. There you go. We're very fortunate uh, to have some members of the community uh, working with us. Um, so Jocelyn started, I believe, in May. Um, Jocelyn Pirenen is our assistant curator of Inui Art. Um, she has a show on display right now that she curated, Small Worlds. Um, she's working very closely with us on this project. Um, Fred Ford, that I work work with for the virtual tours. Um, he's also helping us um, connect with members of the communities. Um, Guta Ashuna is a local artist um, and she is Shuvanai Ashuna, or no, sorry, Shuvanai Ashuna's cousin. Um, um, Pitsialak Ashuna is her grandmother. Um, so she brings a wealth of history and knowledge and uh, her son, Joe uh, also sells his art at the WAG. Um, they both have pieces in the collection, so we're very fortunate to be working with them as well. And this is our team of uh, curator, curators for the inaugural exhibition. Um, and they're just bringing a lot of energy to this contemporary exhibition that they're gonna be opening. So as we were saying for this platform we're working on, we're really wanting to use the records that we have to um, allow people to get better access to the artwork. Um, and that's allowing us to more widely disseminate this information. So um, each artwork in the gallery has a corresponding file with information relating to it, uh, which you can see a picture there from my old office with one side of the filing, there's quite a few. Um, and you know, those all have papers in them which you have to physically be in the room, have to make an appointment with me if you're doing a paper or whatever to access those. Um, additionally, we have a really great resource of interviews conducted by the curator Darlene White with different artists that she's done over the course of her career at the WAG. So 30 years of tapes. Um, as demonstrated by the box of tapes. We actually have like four or five boxes of tapes, um, which as you were saying, we're struggling with having to figure out how to digitize them and do transcripts and everything like that to make them accessible. So my background's more in photography um, digitization, so doing oral is a different aspect of this to me. But with that, we also have to get permissions and make sure everything is um, right, which is a lot of extra work, but is really needs to get done um, to make these available online. And uh, then we have to make sure that they're in an appropriate format, because you don't want to do all this work and then find out you did everything wrong and they're not usable anyway. So that's another big issue that we're dealing with and having to work on. But I think it'll be a huge payoff in the end and I hope everyone will eventually get to enjoy this platform. Um, I think it'll be also a great way to generate more content for the collection when people see these stories and see these artworks. Um, maybe they'll have their own stories, uh, their histories with these pieces and be able to share that information with us. So. 
I forgot to mention that we're hoping that the platform that's on the touch screens is also available online so people all over the world can access the information as well. That's an important yes. part of it, is sharing the information. And that's it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. We're, we're, we're going to, we had a short break scheduled in here, or should we just keep going? Just keep on going? Does anybody need to stretch or get okay? <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Jennifer Smith, uh, I think Jennifer is the first uh, repeat panelist in the series that we've done. We, you were part of the indigenization panel that was part of the um, Smoke Signals mm -hmm. Communications Conference and uh, is back again, a Métis curator, writer, arts administrator. Uh, sh she works at Video Pool Media Arts Centre as the distribution manager. Um, whenever I've been over there, you're in a, you know, a, a, a climate-controlled room and managing all sorts of stuff. So, um, uh, incredibly uh, involved in all sorts of things, working with uh, VUCAVU, which I, I'm hoping you'll explain a little bit about, um, and Platform Art Gallery uh, with the Crafts Council, um, Open Cinema Mawa, the Crafts Museum and Library, um, just all over the place yeah. and, and <laughs> keeps popping up here speaking for us. So yeah. uh, Jennifer, please uh, yeah. tell us your story. Great, well thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm going to talk about media art archives in Canada, which um, across the country mainly are housed, or I guess I'm talking about media art archives in artist-run centers across Canada, more specifically, um, that are yeah that are housed in various media art centers and um, are accessible and have been collected in various ways. So I'm going to focus largely on video pool, but I do like to give a little bit of context outside of that and. Um, bring a bigger understanding of media art centers across the country and the history of them and how we've come to the place we're at today. Um, so in the, the 70s and 80s, media art centers were popping up around the country. Um, basically, a lot of funding was being put out to have centers that artists could create work in. Um, but a lot of centers, so specifically like Video Pool, decided at the same time as they were creating centers to um, share equipment in that there were other services that were needed. Uh, Video Pool, the, the founding members chose to create a distribution department at the exact same time, viewing that as essential to their careers as artists. So that meant that the distribution center would take in their videos, send those videos out into the world, and try and get them exhibition um, at festivals, galleries, um, get sales in educational institutions, um, negotiate sales to institutions like the WAG or the National Gallery or various large galleries. Um, and uh, that, in terms of what distribution is, is really how the majority of the distribution centers across the country continue to work today. Um, so Video Pool is sort of unique in that we have both a production center, distribution center, along with other departments of programming, education, um, but there's actually very few centers that uh, across the country that house all of those things. There's only a, one other um, in Vancouver, Vivo. Um, but otherwise, there's a lot of centers that are specifically programming and production centers, and then um, there's a distribution centers that sort of function on their own as organizations. All of these centers throughout the years have collected work, and I think that's sort of a, an important thing to understand that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of works of video art and independent film in these media art centers across the country. But they've all been cared for, collected, and um, made accessible in different ways. Um, so uh, I'll give an example of some of the centers that are solely production centers. Um, they have uh, sort of, a lot of them have mandated themselves to take on the work of of the artists that are creating work there. So they'll ask every artist who makes a film or video in their centers or a piece of sound work to deposit that, that work of art with the center. 
Um, and that really is just for archival purposes to be able to say these works were made here. It definitely has been an imperfect system that different centers have um, uh, like done in, in different ways. So some places will you know, have been very strict about it, taken lots of those works in. Some of them um, were a little more loosey-goosey and it was just, you know, if they could catch the artist on the right moment and make a copy of their tape, they would do it. Some of them sort of stopped as digital um, means of making work became more prominent and really just kept these tape assets but weren't really collecting the digital assets, things like that. So. Um, none of them have a, a real representation or I think a full representation of what's been created and some of them have even begun more just keeping sort of a database of what was created there as opposed to keeping the assets of film and video. Distribution centers on the other hand are, are, have, have a whole um, different way of the ways that we've we've brought work into our centers. So um, at, at Video Pool, and this is very similar to every other distribution center across the country, um, work was coming to us because artists wanted exhibition. They weren't really that concerned with being part of a collection or being archived. Um, the idea was that really we were just there to do the work to get them exhibition or sales or create income for them in various ways. Um, but what ended up happening in the, in the 90s, so Video Pool, um, having been founded in 1983, um, had about 10 years of videotape in our, in our archive, or what we didn't consider an archive, but a collection at that point, um, and realized that these tapes were degrading, um, they needed to be cared for, they needed to be tracked in better ways, um, things had gone missing, um, there were duplicates of things that we'd sent out as screeners that were maybe being viewed as archival materials, like th things were just not really, um, they, we, weren't, we weren't functioning as a place that was an archive, we were functioning as a place that was working to get exhibition. And so um, many of the centers throughout this same time across the country were doing this work to create um, an archive, so a way of tracking things about each of the, the at the time, videotapes in our collection. So um, we all started creating databases that hold information about what exhibitions were um, gotten, um, various histories of the artists themselves, um, information about each title, so where it had been sent out, even just to be previewed, even if it didn't get an exhibition, things like that. So some of that was really functional in terms of caring for own, our own administrative work as distributors, but also has amassed a huge amount of archival information about each of these um, works of art individually. Um, Video Pool was the first uh, um, distribution center or artist run center um, or media art artist run center in Canada to have a, a temperature and humidity controlled vault. So we built that in the early 2000s. Um, at the time we were lucky to have an archivist working with us to um, get everything set up um, in the be within best practices of, of caring for AV and um, it was, it was a huge thing. It's interesting, the um, second temperature and humidity controlled vault in Canada was also in Winnipeg, which is the Winnipeg Film Group, um, and them focusing on um, caring for film, where ours had its own specifications of caring for video. Um, but then, since then, other centers have grown to that, and I guess I could maybe, this is um, a picture of, well, just one of the shelves in Video Pool's vault. Um, Every distribution center and probably every media art center across Canada will have some sort of shelving with thousands of tapes on it like this. So um, I think I just looked at the number and in our vault we have 3,400 tapes um, that are of video, so, or like of video art, but then on top of it we've collected programs of, um, that video pools hosted over the years. So videos of um, different screenings or events that have happened as well. So it's a real interesting collection 
of the history of video art in the prairies, I'd say, in, in, um, in our vault. Um, I will say that, uh, again, in the similar ways to the production centers, it's, it is an incomplete history. Like, it's not that you can come into our vault and say, I'm going to know everything about video art in the prairies from this, this vault, or I'm going to know everything about even Winnipeg video art from it. Um, because again, we work under the premise of artists wanting to work with us. So um, although we do request artists, I definitely approach artists often to say, come into distribution with us, which automatically means your work is archived. Um, it isn't a practice of collecting that is about collecting the history. It's about collecting the work that we're distributing and caring for the work that we're distributing. Um, so yeah, as I said, there's um, many of the distributors have become archives and have registered with um, the various provincial archive associations, um, are really um, up on AV archiving methods and best, best practices, which, you know, change as technologies change very frequently. Um, we all have a history of working together. Um, so over the years, uh, the distribution centers have all um, spent time meeting together, talking about pra best practices. Um, a great example is, uh, also of just sharing information is um, VTape out of Toronto, which is a video art distributor, has created um, a booklet on um, on best practices, but also on um, doing evaluations of tapes and various things like that, that is just openly shared. So it's work that they were able to get funding for that now the rest of us don't need to seek out funding for because we can use their information, which is a really wonderful way for us to be all working together and sharing information like that. Um, so. I'm sure I've mainly focused on this discussion of tapes, but we also are no longer in the age of anyone using tapes um, at all. So um, since, uh, since this time of beginning this collection, technologies have changed so much. So um, even just in what you can see on this screen, you'll see that there is various formats of analog video. So um, there's Umatic, there's Beta, we have a lot of um, very unstable mini DVs. Uh, I mean, all of this is likely <laughs> very unstable at this point, but uh, the, we have um, DV cams, VHS tapes, there, you know, anything that an artist was making work on was brought to us. Um, also because of, of us, it specifically being artist driven and, and trying to meet artist needs there's a lot of like complicated stuff with caring for the information so on one tape might be five works by one artist or um, tapes might have been lost al along the years and when we go back and do audits of the the tapes we might find a title only on a tape that has works with five other artists on it so it's not um, We've come up with some, I think, really good systems to be able to track all of that, and we continue working on that. But it also isn't, um, there's nothing straightforward about it. It's definitely, you know, you have to be um, going in, you're looking at the tapes, checking them out, figuring out if they're useful or what you need. Um, and then on top of that, now we're in this place of digitization. So. Um, we have digitized, I think, about 60% of our collection at this point, which is huge. So our collection, although I said we have 3,500 tapes, our collection is 2,200 titles of video. Um, and when I say 60%, I'll also say that some of that has been born digital, so it wasn't um, ever created on tape. It was made through um, digital means. Um, but we were really lucky in the mid-2000s to have um, someone who works with us now, Kelsey Braun, um, be really excited to learn about digitization and just want to volunteer and hang out at Video Pool all the time. And he digitized a large portion of our collection through that volunteer work. Um, and then we've 
done some of our own digitization since then and also um, through some funding been able to get grants to digitize as well. Um, so I will talk, I'll talk a little bit more about digitization in just a second, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the types of works in the collections and things that we're sort of known for. So um, Video Pool in the, the 90s and early 2000s was very well known for having um, an amazing collection of queer work. So um, people like There's a Cat Hand, who you'll see is the, in the first uh, image there, created some of their first vid videos through Video Pool um, funding their work. So that's kind of amazing. So you'll see a very young Lori Blondeau um, on, the, on the left, a very, very young There's a Cut Hand, and somehow an ageless Shauna Dempsey <laughs> in this picture. Um, and then next uh, is Shauna Dempsey and Lori Milan. So um, I think uh, it's also important to acknowledge that um, because of Video Pool and because of this archive, um, with the fire that recently happened in, in Winnipeg, Shauna and Lori lost a huge amount of their work, but their video work is all maintained at Video Pool, cared for, um, documenting documentation of all their performances is held with us. Uh, the majority of it has been digitized, but it is also all on tape. So um, it's interesting to think about, um, we never we never thought of the value of, like we knew it was value to have those things because it just was so exciting and important, but also the ways that um, it really can benefit artists when things go wrong for them. So in, in that case, a very, um, tragic wrong, but sometimes it's just the tape that you saved didn't work anymore, or you lost it, or, you know, I have definitely had artists who are like, oh, I left it in my mom's basement, and my mom threw it out. So like, you know, when we have it, so it's, it's great. Um, and then the next still is um, James Dixon. This is his latest work called Homegrown, but James is an artist that we funded his very first video in 2000 and seven, I think, um, and he's gone on to make, I think, at least 15 videos since then. Um, recently, this new video called Homegrown was shown um, at the Toronto Queer Film Festival, um, and it's just interesting to see how um, we also, in a way, are archiving this relationship that we're building with these artists. There's, there's this history that shows their work and also their connections to the media arts community. Um, and then the bottom magical holographic images is uh, Reva Stone's only single channel video. So um, amazing to think about an artist who's spent her life working um, in technology-based art, who's one of the most innovative artists working in digital and technology work, um, who created this video that uh, happened in 1980, I think five, and is, you know, it has recently been screened at least three or four times in the last couple of years through our archive um, and still exists in fairly good shape. I mean, it was made in 1985, so it doesn't look HD or anything, but it's, it's accessible and looks quite, quite good um, to be able to show. And then people like Leslie Snup Supnit, uh, who, had, who started her animation career at Video Pool, um, just wanting to learn and created work. Or Freya Olofsson, who is a huge international name and is showing work all over the world. Um, this video right here, um, or this still of a video, was her working um, at the Bauhaus in Germany, creating work um, alongside a piece in their archive, and now that's here in our archive. So just really interesting to think of how these things happen. Um, and just pointing out again, like a lot of the work coming into the catalog is really there because artists want it there. So it is the ways that Video Pool is able to foster relationships with our members and the, the media arts community that brings these histories in. Um, so you, you know, and some of it is how artists are working. So you'll notice in our collection, as I said, there's this large component of 
um, LGBTQ work that happened over a couple decades that was really popular. And Shonda Dempsey always says to me that at, in those times, there was nowhere else for people to access that type of content. And so through video art centers and festivals was the way that people were able to connect with their communities and find themselves on screen. Um, so that it's, you know, kind of amazing to, to think about that. Um, and then, you know, looking at um, Indigenous works, um, it's interesting to also see there's a very defined line in the, in the mid to late 90s when Indigenous artists seem to be starting to take up video art um, more than, than previous to that. And there's a, that's when you'll see sort of this explosion of video art happening um, amongst Indigenous artists or um, a, lot of, a lot of our collection is programs that Video Pool will have um, put together that um, will bring together some Indigenous artists to create new videos um, and that's all part of the collection. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about access and I'm going to focus on Vukavu just because it's a project that I am worked on and was one of the founding members of, um, but also in my opinion has potential to be one of the um, best um, ways to make these archives accessible um, in Canada at the moment. So Vukavu is an online platform that is um, the, a collaboration of eight independent distributors across Canada. So ranging from BC to, um, to uh, Quebec. So unfortunately, the Atlantic provinces don't have a distributor of their own. So a lot of those things end up actually at video pool, um, tape, other, other distributors. Um, and we now, I, um, we're about to take on a um, ninth distributor in the north, so there'll be a ninth uh, partner on this project starting soon. Um, so when you go to this site, essentially you create an account. Um, there are several ways that you can use the site. So um, if you're a curator, you can create a professional account that allows you access to research the site. It gives you access to some videos that are not accessible to the public so that if you were looking for newer things that are more about getting them into galleries or festivals, um, you, can, you can preview those. Um, there's a public portion where um, anyone can create an account and there's two ways that it can be used. We often have free programming on the site, so we'll engage curators or, you know, it, then when they say curators, it's not always a professional curator. It might be someone who's a musician in, when, er, in Canada that has an interest in independent video or maybe doesn't, but just, you know, we for some reason engage them and, and they chose some work and talked about why they were interested in those works. Um, so there'll be programs like that on the site that are always free. And when we say free, we, I also want to clarify that um, a side-by-side -side thing with this distribution slash archival work is that our goals are always to ensure that money is getting into artists' hands. So if Vukovu is putting something up for free, um, they're getting paid through Vukovu to be able to license that work and show it for free. Um, that is a very unique thing to distribution archives in that we were there first to create income for artists. So that is something that comes back consistently whenever our collections are made, um, made public. Um, and then also you can rent videos on Vukovu. Um, so these, these works on Vukovu come from our archives and our collections. Um, there are some things I'll say in Video Pool's collection where the artists have specifically said, I don't ever want this shown again, but I'm really cool with it being in the archive. Um, so, you know, those won't ever go on here. But um, I, at this point, there's, between the eight distributors, I think there's just under 3,000 videos on Vukovu. Um, one of the distributors, and hopefully Video Pool will be doing this soon too, also has um, ways to access works that aren't, um, aren't viewable. So if you just want to look through a distributor's entire catalog and just be able to find those works on here, um, it also might 
be a kick in the butt to some of us to get that work up there if you requested, like, I noticed there isn't a video for this one, I wanna see it. Um, but a, a way to sort of also, in a, I don't wanna say database, but a way to sort of database or search um, works that maybe the videos aren't ready to go online for yet. Um, and Video Pool specifically has 200 of our videos on um, VukaVu. I think we actually have 202 videos on VukaVu currently for access. But obviously, as I said, we have a collection of 2,200 videos. So that labor of getting that entire collection on the site is really important to us. Um, it's something that we are continuously seeking funding for to try and make it accessible. Um, it is a bilingual site too, so not every video will be in, in French and English, but um, there is a French and English side to the site, and I have a hope that soon we will have an Indigenous side to the site. Um, so uh, it might not be specifically language-based, but I would love there to be a special in, in the same way that there's a special French side of the site, a special side of the site that's specific to the Indigenous work on the site. Um, and that's a goal that I bring to this project, um, or a, a request I bring to this project constantly that we begin seeking funding for that. Um, so this, for me, is some of the future of how access to these archives will will happen. Um, it's not as fast as we would like, but it is, um, in my opinion, the best hope we have at the moment to create sort of a online uh, accessibility point for um, film and video archives in Canada. And it, again, won't be, it could be, but it, it likely won't be the full story because uh, depending on who partners are, choose to be some Distribution centers have decided that they want to create their own platform, so um, there are a couple who have sort of separated off and chosen not to be part of this project. Um, so it, it is always difficult to think about what that, um, that full story of Canadian media art is, and, and it, can there ever be a place to ac access it or learn about it? Um, so I'll just before I end, talk a little bit about some of our challenges, um, because I think that it's really important to acknowledge that as artist-run centers, uh, when you look at what artist-run centers generally do, they're not spending a lot of time um, digitizing, archiving, um, you know, most places are focused on programming, potentially some education. Um, the funding for artist-run centers generally doesn't focus around um, historical content. Um, and so I don't, I don't always want to come back to funding, but funding is a challenge in terms of being able to figure out how to care actively for this archive. Um, and also acknowledging that in some of those um, challenges that includes ideas around um, format. So as, as I talked a lot about the tape formats, but now we have digital formats. Um, there's tons of digital formats. Um, we've created a set of best practices amongst um, the media arts community of what at this point we view as, as best to be able to um, create our digital archives on. So different codecs, well, there's one codec that we specifically have chosen to use, but we also know those um, formats of digital files are constantly evolving and they won't be the same in five years as they are now. Um, and that in the process of digitizing and upgrading from tapes, we're nearly at the point of needing to begin up to upgrading digital files, never mind just upgrading from tapes. Um, so these are really unique problems for an artist-run center to be um, working within, um, to be caring for. Um, as I said, funding is difficult. Um, expertise is difficult. So everything I know about digital archives, I have learned at Video Pool. Um, there, it wasn't, I did work at the film group before I worked at Video Pool, so I was beginning to learn a little bit of it there. And I've spent a lot of time um, working on gaining that knowledge. 
but it, there's like, I think it, there's also needs to be acknowledgement of, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not an AV archivist. And so what does it mean to have those expertise or professionals coming in um, to not have someone on site all the time, but, you know, bring them in when we can get funding for that. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, along with the fact that, um, for me, my, my biggest fear um, in being able to maintain the works that we haven't digitized, more so than the tapes not holding up, is the equipment to digitize not holding up. So along with being able, learning, or along with us as a center caring for tapes and digital files, we have to care for um, various st styles of decks. So, um, Umatic decks, beta decks, mini DV decks, I think are the three that we've really focused on because they're what we have the majority of our collection in. Um, but it's, that, is, that is the most important thing for us at this point is like ensuring that the two or three decks that we have um, will continue working to be able to access this work. Um, so I, yeah, I think that sort of sums up everything that I wanted to talk about. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, now the um, agenda says we're going to have a fireside chat. I think it's appropriate on a night like tonight that we have a fire to cozy up to. Um, access, uh, you all spoke about the efforts that you're going to to digitize collections or to organize and to archive and maintain. I wanted to, to touch back with you, Jerry, first on, you were talking about the use of these tools of re-educating your knowledge keepers. Um, can, you, can you just speak a little bit about what, what that means and, and looks like and, and why, these two, why these collections become so valuable in that sense? Sure, I, mean, I think one of the things I want to communicate most strongly is that um, as a person practitioner, as a program, I stay out of the way of communities and what they need to do. That I'll give people a model of something that will work and they can change it or they can throw it away as, as they see fit. So in terms of, um, there are a couple of communities that I know of that are doing this sort of re-educating or this, um, uh, it's difficult to know what semantics to use in talking about it, but in um, bringing our own traditional um, responsibility holders back up to that position and giving them that same place in the community that they once had and that was taken away by a colonial government. Um, Re-educating has sort of the wrong connotation to it. Um, and I mean, I probably used the term myself, but uh, in, sort of reintroducing the privilege, understanding of privileges that you have and the responsibilities that you have and the history that goes along with your name um, and those traditions uh, are, we lionize our recordings. We hold them up as if it was an, a complete thing, but everything is incomplete. So the way I contextualize things is that our collections of recordings are fragments. They're fragments of knowledge that have to be contextualized within living people. That we have knowledge left in our communities, but our elders are aging. The people who grew up speaking Haltukla are few. My father is one of them. He didn't speak English until he was eight years old. So we have people who can speak to these fragments of knowledge that we have and give them co the context that they need, but they're not a knowledge system unto themselves. So we have to, um, this is the part that frustrated me the most when I started was that when you, work with archivists, there is a hard-fought demand to best practice, to accommodate the highest possible standards to digitizing, no matter what that means in terms of access. So you don't do things until you can do them properly, until you have all of your questions answered. But there's nobody I know who started out knowing all the answers. Nobody. So everybody who pretends that they did, didn't. Um, but then they did stop everybody else from starting until they're at that place that, that you are. So, um, so I guess uh, sort of a long-winded answer is that uh, um, 
we try to help people digitize their collections and then the important work starts. Um, and if we wait until we're perfect to preserve digitally, like for the digitization process, until we have all of the storage and everything long-term uh, preservation aspects thought out, then those collections will die and our elders will die. Then we'll have no more equipment. We'll sit there just waiting for answers and not do anything. So to me, it's those practical steps of what you can do to move forward so that communities can do that work in and of themselves. Because again, you have tremendous diversity in language, but that comes with diversity in culture and practice and protocol. So all of these communities will have to do things slightly different and you have personalities and all the other um, variables that go along with being, just being human. So, uh, so for me, it's a matter of staying out of the way. <laughs> it's a matter of giving people practical steps that they can take to go forward and not giving people some long-winded, complicated answer that's not an answer. So. Awesome. And at the, the art gallery, um, you showed boxes of tapes. <laughs> what what is the content? What what's on those tapes, and and why is it important to to preserve those? Do you want to talk well, part of the issue is that we only partially know. Um, <laughs> we have to listen to them all first. Um, they're conversations that our curator of any art had with different artists about, I think, exhibitions or artwork that they were creating, stories. stories. Um, she travels up north a lot and has great relationships with lots of people. Um, so from the last 30 years. Yeah, 30. Collection of, of interviews, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so it's 30 years of interviews and um, we know there's good information on there, but we really have to listen to everything first and then um, format shift it over to digital and then do transcripts of it to really make it usable and um, have have the story of the artwork that those artists were telling. Right, so, so you're going to try to listen to those stories and match it to pieces of art and stories and biographies of the artists. Yes. Yeah, we yes. Think this project's kind of a unique opportunity to digitize those tapes and access that information. And it could be useful to researchers outside too. We get a, obviously a lot of research requests for people writing books or their dissertations on different artworks or artists or communities and eventually that could possibly expand to include these resources if we get the proper permissions and mm -hmm. access available. Well. Wow. It's a lot of information. Um, was this, is, is that a question? Are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> I th so I think that there are several things to think about within that. So it depends on what is happening like if you made a video today um, it, it depends on what you as an artist want to make it on so for example I just got our first 4k work into the catalog at video pool recently and that isn't a standard of what we take um, we generally ask for um, Apple ProRes um, H.264 no, not H264, Apple ProRes um, 422 at the moment. And um, that is pretty much the highest quality, easily usable file at the moment um, that, that can be exported. But um, the realities are that not all artists have works on those codecs for various reasons. So if it's something you've previously made um, that was born digital, you might have exported it um, just as an MP4 that um, is, say, a codec of H.264. And so if that's what you bring or that's how you, you the best quality you have, then that's how you, you should keep it. So keep it as the best quality that you have. If you're trying to archive for yourself, I'd say, you know, and this is what we do at Video Pool right now. We are hoping to get a, a better archival or digital archival system but right now, I keep um, 
our work's all on a RAID, so it backs up. There's two drives, or I think there's three drives that it backs up to consistently, so if one fails, I have another backup. And then I transfer that all onto a hard drive, and I bring that hard drive home, and I update that every month so that if there was a fire at video pool or a, a pipe bursting, which has happened, luckily it didn't affect our archive, um, there is a backup offsite. Um, and so those are, those are the things that we do um, currently that are easy for you to do too. Um, and for, as I said, I think it's just the best quality of the video file that you have is what you should try and um, keep for yourself. And if you're coming to a distributor that you bring to a distributor, um, and you know, looking at something like Riva Stones that we digitized, in some ways, a lot of people, when I send it out, will say, well, I'd like that to look better. And it's like, well, it was made in 1985. And there's a lot of, recently, Diana Thornycroft wanted one of her digitized videos, and it was made in 1982. And she was like, that looks awful. Like, can, can you fix that? And I was like, no, like, that's what it looked like when you videotaped it. It really, like, that, it didn't look any better at the time. Like, maybe there's a couple lines on the video now. So I think that it's important to acknowledge that there is also something um, authentic about when it was created and the quality of how it was created then. And I personally um, get challenged on uh, people wanting better quality from past works, but I think that it's really important to um, value what it was at that time and not spend a lot of time worrying about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> totally. Uh, oh, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask Jennifer, uh, is that in your policies that you have to take it home? No. Okay. Um, it was very nice to see it. It was just something, uh, so just to note that um, several, I think two years in a row, a pipe burst at Art Space, and luckily, neither year they affected like video pools archival space. Uh, one year it did affect our office though. Um, so after the first year that it happened and it affected the film group who actually, their hard drives weren't destroyed. Like they did, they had stuff, but some of their hard drives um, did get really messed up from this flood. I, I immediately decided that I needed to start taking it home. And if I don't work there, we need to find someone else who will find an offsite place, yeah. Um. We have a question here. I mean, oh. yeah, yes, like it's uh, there. There's quite a breadth. Um, like a lot of things, there are specific funding pools that will affect what the lion's share of things are. So you have traditional use studies that were funded under legal research. You have things like autobiographies that were funded under Friendship Center funding um, in the late 70s, I think it was. Um, you'll have language um, recordings from language programs that were started in the 2000s mostly. Um, but then you have the academic work of um, that would have been uh, you have some government recordings around um, uh, almost what Indian agents or government workers were curious about, but you would have recordings from the late 40s on, on Open Reel um, that are, uh, those are often held in academics' hands or um, at major institutions, but then you have a lot of um, academics who um, were sort of on the front edge of working well with community and would repatriate their, would get leave a copy of their recordings with community. So you'll often have cassettes that are dubbed from open reel or open reels that are um, like two five inch reels that are a dub of a seven or some, um, some sort of strange um, copy of a, um, of an original recording. Um, so oftentimes you'll have one recording that is copied on two, that is on two different tapes. So you'll have sort of similar content on two different things that overlap uh, or else things that start. Uh, we have some cassettes that you'll see that have um, where somebody starts an open reel recording on one speed and then switches the speed part way through. So the cassette, when they dub it, they just play it on one speed. So part of the recording is, you know, either too slow or too fast. Um, but then in the cassette realm, that's really confusing for people because there was no speed setting on cassettes. 
Uh, so it's, a, again, you have a lot of different academic disciplines, a lot of different external people coming in and extracting these recordings from community, and then those recordings sometimes get back to community. Um, more and more we're seeing uh, community being the sort of primary place of deposit after uh, academic passes away. Um, and uh, again, that's sort of haphazard in that sometimes a widow will just throw away in similar ways to talking about artists, you know, um, their mother throws away <laughs> some of their work. Uh, you have family of academics throwing away original recordings of community language or cultural recordings. So it's a, uh, uh, then you have potlatch and meeting minutes is another huge one. So you have hundreds and hundreds of tapes that are from like band or um, tribals, um, uh, tribal association, tribal council, meeting minutes, and you sort of think of those as records, but the amount of cultural material in those is really quite staggering, that they'll most often be started with prayer, there'll be ceremony, there'll be language, there'll be elders coming in, yelling at their governance, telling them what they're doing wrong and what they should be doing. There, there's really a tremendous amount of, um, of authentic traditional knowledge in meeting minutes. Um, and it also is a really good record of what sort of colonial imposition is and what the burning issues of the day are. So um, it's, yeah, it's all over the place. Um, the, like the Library and Archives Canada grant is available countrywide. And that's, uh, so that's for language work. But then again, for my own program, we consider pretty much anything that a community wants to call cultural heritage, cultural heritage. So Library and Archives Canada is not gonna go do some audit of the content to see whether or not that cassette tape had specific Cree or something else on it. If it's, um, so I mean, it's sort of up to the community to decide, what, um, but like that is a good, um, it's a well-structured grant, and it is, and it does have two more rounds coming up. Um, uh, but uh, but again, we are trying purposely to make training and resources available countrywide. That uh, whether it's me coming to deliver a workshop or really trying to get information into more people's hands so that more people can deliver workshops or more. Um, like if I had the information that I was releasing when I started, I would have been five years ahead of the game. That there are smart people doing great work all over the place who literally can just, you know, look at a video online. Like that's how you knowledge transmitted now. It's YouTube videos. So I, like I have no question that we don't need to have full workshops all over the place that smart people can just watch a video and know what they need to do, so. <clears throat> I'm going to be really quick with this in that um, when um, you were talking about at the art gallery, listening to all the tapes and figuring out what was on it before you start to digitize, that's one of those sort of barriers to digitization within Indigenous communities is that you have to need to know the intellectual property and claim ownership over that thing before you're allowed to apply for a grant to digitize it. And within my own grant, we've said just claim, like if you say you have ownership, we're not going to question you. That. Uh, um, that there's so much that we don't know what's on it that if we wait to do all of that um, work of listening to everything, you know, we're wearing out those machines that we need to digitize our materials. So to me, it's, uh, um, to be frank, those are questions that are answered in the digital realm. That, um, that as much as that is a legal and academic and, uh, you know, a, a part of best practices. I say digitize something because it's so much easier to determine content in the digital realm. And if you need to delete something because you don't have um, the privilege of, of keeping it or reformatting it, um, I would rather force somebody to hit a delete button than to not lose it due to inaction. Um, so, uh, so to me, I mean, I think the storage problem is something that we're all struggling with. Uh, like we're all trying to look at especially video and see how do we store this much information. 
um, especially when best practices says uncompressed, which like ProRes doesn't meet best practices. And, you know, and, and I'm not an advocate for uncompressed. Like I, I know that almost nobody can handle that workflow. And true archival workflow is sort of uncompressed and then compressed in a lost list and then within a open container and nothing reads that. Like, so for anybody who actually has to make that stuff available at high quality, it's so much work to bring it back. Um, like I think a lot of answers are going to be handled, a lot of the storage questions will be answered through technological in innovation. Um, you know what I was trying to say there. Um, <laughs> that, uh, but like technology will catch up and give us fast, big storage. We'll, we'll figure that part out, but we need to have we need to get band-aid solutions to have that material online so i um so as much as i mean i think everybody has to figure out what their line in the sand is for how they do their selection you know but just keep digitizing like i i'm not really in favor of throwing things away yet like in in my practice there are certain things that yeah you can acknowledge aren't all that important but uh but for me you like even if we just digitize all the important stuff, we're still probably going to lose stuff. So I don't think we're at the stage of deciding and throwing away. We can just let you know nature take its course, and uh, what we don't get to, we don't get to. So, any of you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I agree. It, it, digitize as much as possible. Um, the way we're narrowing it down for this project is, um, fortunately, there are labels saying the artists, so we're able to connect the artists to the artworks um, that we're specifically looking at for this project. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful too that the storage issue will resolve itself in the future, um, hopefully. I don't know if you wanna add to that. Well, I'm a little bit more lucky than these other two because our digital holdings are much less. Um, I don't really have a digital storage issue. I just buy bigger hard drives. Um, but yeah, I'm all in favor of digitizing everything. I think I'm more of a pack rat for um, paper materials. <laughs> <laughs> just put everything in the file. Um, I think art galleries in general kind of track every single piece of information that has to go with an object and that's just kind of how things are in the museum world. So I don't think that really answered your question. <laughs> but just take all the information pretty much and it's really more of a workflow issue. And I might, I mean, Emma knows this, but I'll just answer for everyone else too. Like, think, I think for me, one of the um, big questions of also um, keeping things is once we've digitized all the tapes, um, the goal for me is that any tape that has been digitized, it will never be played again. Um, but we are still archiving the tape and caring for the tape. So I think this is something that also is sort of this question of what is the value of this tape? Because we don't know if it will play again. We, we know we've digitized it and it's accessible that way. Um, is there value in keeping this, these, this tape or several versions of that tape, not versions, but copies of that tape? And so those are the, that, those are the questions for me of, enough because um, in terms of information about the artwork and where it's gone and its history, I don't think there can be enough. I'd love to know every detail of it and I hope one day people do choose to come research things like that at Video Pool about the artworks there. And some people have, but I, I always hope more people will at some point. Um, but it's really, you know, what, and I, and I think a lot of the artists that I've been talking to lately have said, so no one will touch my tape again once it's digitized. And I'm like, I really don't think so. Like the goal should be that access comes through the digital file. And so uh, I don't have an answer to this. I just also thought it was like, this was a, an appropriate place to bring up like, uh, do we keep those tapes forever? And um, is that too much information to be keeping when the content of the tapes is being stored elsewhere and cared for elsewhere um, and upgraded to be usable? So I have zero answers to that at this point. Um, I'm still putting resources and energy into caring for 
um, and ensuring that the tapes are, are um, safeguarded, but I just thought I would mention that as well. Anyone have anything else to, to ask of the panelists? And you have... Just adding to the physical collection um, question, uh, back in, say, the 2000s, the physical tape would still be your primary archival copy. So even after digitization, you, the physical thing was still the thing that gave somebody comfort and was held. That meant you put a lot of effort into the physical storage and you would buy new archival containers for all of your collection. And so, so much money and effort was spent into your workflows around the physical thing. And what I'm seeing now is that that's not happening. That people are still reshelving, they're still holding their physical collections, but they're putting almost no money into rehousing or doing upgrades of the physical sort of storage. So you're, you just sort of see a trajectory of that not being the primary archival um, copy after digitization, the digitized copy, the digital copy is, um, and people not putting effort in. The people who have wholesale thrown away copies, that's almost universally been a mistake so far. <laughs> That, that that something has gone wrong with that practice, but uh, but you can see it going that way. Um, what you what I can see in the future, though, um, that hasn't manifested yet, but the same way that you see for grooved um, analog material, you have optical um, like microscopy. I can't talk today. Uh, being able to do an optical transfer rather than a mm -hmm. transfer with a stylus. Um, there's no theoretical reason that you can't do a magnetic reading of the tape um, so that you're not actually playing it in real time. You're actually just transferring um, sectors of the tape and making a map of it and then allowing software to rebuild it. Um, in th a million people in theory have said that's possible, but nobody I know of has actually worked on it. But if that was worked on, that would mean that you wouldn't have friction issues anymore, you would, that you'd be able to map any tape sort of regardless of format and then write software to um, do what electrical circuits do now in terms of decoding. So it wouldn't be subject to so critical timing and equipment and sort of headwear. And so it's, it's an interesting thought that we could do a much, much better job in the future of all of these formats with, with that technology. Uh, but it will probably be very, very expensive. And <laughs> I think in your case, it's interesting to think because you're working with artworks, is the physical tape the artwork or is it just the file? Yeah. I don't know, I don't know either. <laughs> and they're copies generally, right? Like it's not the original version in the mm -hmm. always. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, well, we're a couple of minutes before the, the scheduled end, but uh, if nobody's got any further questions, um, I think we should thank the panelists and uh, wrap up for the evening. So thank you very much. Thank you.